If you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now today we've, I've been asked to do some teaching on deacons, and so that's what we plan to do today um, as we've entered into this period of uh, election and um, very, very important time for the, for the church. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm just going to read the first um, 13 verses. Everyone found it? 1 Timothy chapter 3. And this is one of those, um, what I would call one of those <laughs> scriptures, okay? Um, because you know, there's been so much teaching over the years and, uh, you know, so many different ideas and traditions that every time you seem to touch it, it seems to be read on. Okay, so here we have 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying, If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as a devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested... And then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women, of, uh, women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children well and his household well. Those who have served well, served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ <coughs> Jesus. Amen. And God will bless the read and uh, the reading of his word to us. And a story is told of a church member who was asked, what is a deacon? He says, oh, that's easy. A deacon is something you put on the top of the hill and you set light to. And he says, no, 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 that's a beacon. That's not a deacon. Okay. As we begin this morning, we must first take into consideration the setting that we have here. We have the Ephesian church, which had over a period of time moved from chaos to being blessed with an effective leadership. And during his time in Ephesus, Paul trained a corps of godly leaders and to lead the church. And when he left, he appointed young Timothy to be the pastor. And he later wrote this letter to him to give him some instructions and also to give him a strategy as to how to build a church. Now, establishing a godly leadership and choosing the right elders and deacons is absolutely crucial. Now, what Paul has done here is to give Timothy a, a checklist of qualifications. And that's useful for us too, so that we don't fall into the trap of inviting someone to stand for a position just because they seem to be the right person. Okay? Oh, they make a good deacon, you know? I remember a friend of mine, he's in heaven now, but he was a, a particularly gifted administrator and um, an accountant. And uh, he was very quickly asked to be the church tre treasurer and secretary, all in one. Well, the church secretary has, has particular requirements, you know, you've got things like a diary, you have to organise so many different bits and pieces. But he had a real problem, and I remember him being in tears on the phone to me, because he was expected to be an elder and not a deacon. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, they, they exercise what we would call a plurality of eldership in their churches, and most churches do. Because they just had deacons, not elders and deacons, the deacons seemed to assume the role of an elder as well. And this poor man was at the point where he had very little experience as a Christian. He was able to do the church business with his eyes shut. You know, that was his experience. He said, I can do the finances, I can do the secretary's job. He said, I don't even have to think about it. That's natural to me. He said, but I can't do the spiritual stuff. And then I had to remind him where he was and what his role as a deacon was. And he was a lot happier about that, although it was a continual struggle for him. 
Now it's important to note for us to note the list of qualifications as we have them here have nothing to do with talent, they have nothing to do with your wealth, they have nothing to do with your position, it's all to do with the rightness of the spirit. It's about those who have Jesus as their Lord and who have the desire to follow him. That is the first and most important qualification. Now, two distinct roles are laid out for us in this passage. First of all, we have elders or overseers, and then we have deacons. The qualifications, of course, are very, very similar, but the roles are different. Elders have a pastoral role, and that pastoral role means that you lead by way of teaching. Deacons are called to lead through practical service. Now, the responsible, responsibility of an elder is to seek the mind of God in order to guide the ministry of the church. So each member of the congregation looks to develop their discipleship and relationship with Jesus. And the elders are to oversee and to encourage and offer guidance when necessary in order that we as the people of God are living in line with the scriptures. So that's my job. Okay. Verse 8, 1 Timothy 3, Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They f must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So as we begin then, it needs to be made clear that the last thing we want to do is disappear down some kind of theological rabbit hole. Okay, I don't want to do that. However, what we do need to do is deal with the teaching that's become a part of our culture and really has little to do with the original intention of the scripture. First then, women and their role. Now you know we've, we've talked about being men or the rest of it, okay? Liberties have actually been taken in the translation that we have and they've had a, an unhelpful knock-on effect in the history of the church, particularly in Western culture. Now a good example of that is in verse 8 here. And it's, it uses the word men. Are to, deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, it says. That word men does not appear in the original Greek text. But it's been added because Paul goes on later in verse 11 to talk about women. Sadly, this is another bad translation that gives the impression that Paul was addressing deacons' wives. There's some division between scholars because the Greek word for wife and woman are the same. But the structure of the sentence, which is the equivalent of verse 8, and I know this is technical, lends itself to understanding of a female deacon because there's no Greek word for deaconess. Okay, so if you're a bit frustrated about this already, I'm very happy to, let, to give you a copy of these notes, okay? Beyond that, on a broader picture, we have to consider other examples. So let me give you one. In Romans 16 and verse 1, it says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she might need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Now, the word used for servant here is the word deacon. Now here's the rabbit hole we don't want to go down because one Sunday service is never going to do the discussion justice. And I know it's not a real issue for us, but for many people it is an issue. But suffice it to say that the issue of women and their role in the church has been a very difficult cultural issue in just about every society that's known to man. Certainly in Roman culture and early Judaism, as we've seen before, women were regarded as possessions and property and so had to mind their place. In our society, men do what the women want them to do, don't they? <laughs> women, you see, were regarded as of little value. And as much, men enjoyed their perceived superiority. And one of the great issues with the advent of Jesus Christ and his subsequently his church has been that gender is actually no qualification. And every human being, regardless of gender, is on level ground and equally has potential in the sight of God. So if we take consideration Galatians chapter 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it doesn't matter what your religious heritage is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. We are all one in Christ Jesus and we're all on level ground. And that's so helpful, isn't it? When you think about the function of the church, for example, we can't really go there today. But you know, many people would put the minister on a pedestal, but the minister is simply, certainly with our former church government, is just a church member who happens to be the pastor. Now another concern has to be about the formation of deacons. Now, in the early church, usually an appeal to Acts chapter 6 is made. Now I want everyone to look with me at Acts chapter 6 here. So we can see this clearly. And we can do a little bit of reading. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will in turn, uh, we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, what we have here is something very interesting, but we have to be careful how we do our cross-reference in here. In some ways, this is a very useful proof text for us for the function of deacons. But that holds the danger of us becoming too, far too prescriptive as to our understanding of their role in much the same way as our attitude to gender. The group in Acts was actually a response to a particular problem. And while the developing church may have used that incident as a pattern to build on, these seven were, called, were never called deacons. They were never given that title. Now it has to be said at this point that absolutely every Christian is called to service. Called to the practical giving of oneself. And that's absolutely essential if the community of God's people is to grow and to prosper and to work effectively. No matter if the task is very menial or considered to be of some importance. Because the life of service is the way of the disciple. And it logically follows then that if we do nothing on a practical level in the community, then we've got to ask some serious questions about our level of stewardship as a disciple. And we have to ask ourselves whether we're actually in the right place. Are we serving the Lord effectively? And that's a real challenge to every single one of us. Because see, the problem is that everyone wants to serve God, but most people want to do it in a, an advisory capacity. You know, one writer puts it like this, the supreme test of service is this, for whom am I doing this? Much of what we call service for Christ is no such thing. If we are doing this for Christ, we shouldn't care about human reward or even recognition. Our work must again be tested by three propositions. He said, is it work from God? Is it work for God? Is it work with God? Good questions. So as we come to Paul's words of instructions then, with that sort of introduction, we have to bear in mind that the term deacon was actually a very favourite word of Paul's. He uses it regularly to describe his own ministry and the ministry of others. And if you want to know where they are, let me tell you. It's in 1 Corinthians 3, um, 3 5, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Romans 16, 1, um, Colossians 1, 23 and 4, 7. So the term was fairly widely used and scattered through his writing. And, and those who were leaders as well understood what that meant. But it fluctuated from an emphasis of function to the description of their position within the church. So it had different meanings all the time. And this is very interesting because the application is that we all function as servants, as deacons. And so the qualifications, if we want to call them that are actually applicable to us all. It's not just people who are holding office that have to maintain these standards. Everyone has to. But some people 
are appointed to be in a specific position of deacon, recognised by the fellowship under God as having the ability to enable others to serve more effectively. And that's what it's about. It's about giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. So in verse 8, look at verse 8 again. Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. So we can be worthy of respect and sincere. This is what I might call a cover term describing personal dignity that makes a deacon similar to the elder or the overseer. The Greek here speaks of being honourable, of being grave and being honest. And so there's not much more we can say about that really, is there? And having started his list on this, we might, what we might consider a very really positive note, it's a good qualification to have, then he goes on to list two prohibitions that would undermine the ministry of any Christian. And this is very important, because appointing an individual to a position of responsibility actually goes beyond their availability to serve, goes beyond their popularity to serve, and it goes beyond their political usefulness to serve. Now, I'm not... I don't, that's not a problem we have here, but I've been in churches where actually, and they've been quite large churches, and actually there's been factions in the church. And what people do when deacons' elections come, and they have go into the little groups, and it, you wouldn't believe it goes on, but it goes on. I don't know if you've seen it. It's awful, and there's nothing spiritual about it. They work it out who they can have to be best on the leadership of the church so they can move the church in the direction that they want to go. I hate to tell you, but you know something, that Christians are sinners as well. The deacon is to exemplify the traits expected of every believer. So the next one was not indulging in much wine. Now, here we see a repeat of verse 3, actually. It means temperate. Specifically, here it's used in regard of alcohol. Now, what the scripture is not saying is that Christians, and particularly office bearers, should be teetotal. Okay, it's not saying that. In verse 3, the meaning is broader, speaking of excesses. But it's talking about being temperate, about being a thinker. So, for example, if we were to look at 2 Timothy 4, for example, it says, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. That phrase, keeping your head in all situations, actually means being having a sober attitude to all things. So if abstinence is, an, is appropriate for you as an individual, then that is a clear choice that you should make. What is important in all of this is that there has to be some balance about it. There has to be some common sense. What happens to sanctified common sense? We don't talk about much nowadays, do we? However, as a rider to that, we need to understand that morals are never negotiable. Clearly, there are some things that we have to abstain from. Things like rage, envy, lies, adultery, theft, greed, and I could go on and on and on. Not to pursue honest, dishonest gain. Now this is so practical, and it's not easy to talk about, but it's real. By way of confirmation of what we've just said, and confirming Paul's opening comments on honesty and honour, there's something important here to emphasise. When you and I are praying about nominating and voting for an individual, we should be aware that our responsibility to and for them doesn't end at that point. With responsibility comes risk, and sometimes responsibility comes temptation. You know, as Christians, we live in a real world. And we've got to stop this over-spiritualizing of our position as God's people. For example, you know, the fact is that in the Christian church per se, I'm talking about the whole Christian church, there's been so much theft, it's unreal. And many people have gone to prison for theft. The reality is that although we're ultimately under God's law, we have to remember that we're under the law of the land as well. And so this means that our behaviour from our accounting right through to how we, choose, how we serve the vulnerable in our community is completely under scrutiny, and so it should be. We are to be careful as to how we choose those who are to have a profile in our community. And we're to be aware that they, we have a responsibility as individuals and corporately as a fellowship 
to be wise in our cho choices and to support those who are elected 100%. If we're not willing to vote for them 100%, then forget it. Anything less is not honourable. Because commitment to the work of God in this place is what we have been called to, regardless of how we feel about it at times. You know, there's sometimes we just feel we could be somewhere else, don't we? Why do I bother going back there? I am fed up with that person. They spoke to me like that again. Oh, they ignored me again. I didn't get the opportunity to do that again. You know, we got all this nonsense that floats around. And you can see the battle that's going on, the spiritual battle there. But we let it eat away at us. But we have been called to this place. This is why we're here. We've said it so many times before. We are the best that God has got for here. We have a stewardship for the people around us. You know, I don't know if you've heard of Adonai Ram Judson. Is he a familiar name to you? He was a missionary to Burma. Oh, I'll lend you his book. Fantastic. And this poor man, he served in the heat for 18 years without furlough. Six years without a convert. Now, he was, he'd suffered torture. He'd an incredible, difficult story. And this poor man, you know, he said that he would watch the boats going out of the port and he wished that he was on every single one. <laughs> then his wife took on well and he had to send her home. And he knew he wouldn't see his wife for two years. <coughs> and he wrote in his diary, listen to this, if we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could just spend the rest of our days in peace, and then he stops himself and he puts a postscript. Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I'm almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. And so he stayed. You know, it's not just people like Adonai Ram Judson who were pioneers in missionary work in difficult countries. It's for us too. We are pioneers here. And this is our responsibility to support those that we call. So we have to be wise in those choices. As the Church of Jesus Christ, we are engaged in a serious business. This is about eternal life and eternal death. And we are called to serve. We are called to serve. Our commitment to Jesus, you see, is reflected in the church. If we fail and we prefer a kind of consumer type faith, then the wider community that God has granted to us as a stewardship, well, they'll just die and go to hell. Is that what you want? See, from highlighting the dangers, Paul then brings Timothy back. And I think it's very clever in the way that he writes. So he doesn't let him get carried away. He said, now look, this, but remember. Then he says... Verse 8 and 9, let's read them again. Deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of faith with a clear conscience. Now, that's a really interesting phrase, actually. Keeping hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. And this phrase, deep truths, <coughs> it's another favourite of Paul's, you see. Its literally meaning is mystery. Now, the deep truth or mystery that Paul is alluding to is totally different meaning to what we would normally attach to those words. Now, so let me put that in context for you. And what it means is this, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. And this will explain what this is. One Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, and if they had, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it's written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We've not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. 
This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that, came, that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Participation in the divine nature. Again, 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 again. You see, here is the essential truth of the gospel. And in particular, the saving character of the death of Jesus. The liberty of this truth is the transforming power that enables every believer. And once again, the emphasis on the deacon is that he or she has a firm <coughs> grasp of the truth in order to be the appropriate enabler and example to the rest of the church family. Do you see that? Look at verse 10. They must first be tested. And then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Now I have to tell you, there is no formal examination to being a deacon. Whew, isn't that great? I remember when we were called to Sazra years ago. And uh, I was sent through the post, an exam paper. And they said, this is an exam. We want you to take your time and just fill it in at your ledger. And it was all these essay questions. Well, I got straight in my books to know, and I was, I was working away. And then I was told I had to go for an interview, I had to have a psychometric test, and then after the psychometric test I was going to go for an interview with the general secretary and the whole council would be sitting there. Now this council was made up of serving and retired senior officers up to, up to Brigadier, I think it was at that stage. And then I was told, but don't forget you got the 100 questions. The 100 questions? Yeah, there's 100 questions you've got to get 99%. You know, otherwise, otherwise you, you can't be allowed to be a scripture reader. You've got to know your Bible. Well, you can imagine, I actually sweated on that one. Oh, memory verse in me. So, one of the questions, and let me ask you a question. What were the names, I've probably asked you before, what were the names of Moses' parents? Anyone? That's the sort of question you'd be asked. Anyone? Any ideas? No, 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 that wasn't, no. Moses' parents. Jacob's, wasn't it? That was Jacob's wife. Got me going now. Or daughter. I don't know, anyway. Moses' parents, Amram and, Amram and Jochebed. How do I know that? Because someone told me the answer and said the only way he remembered it was someone had two dogs and they called them Amram and Jochebed. And that's the only way I remember. <laughs> you know, now... I was, I was actually panicking about this, you know. And I was wondering, actually, maybe we should have a weekly Bible quiz. And I should say, right, here's a question, Bible question, and get you to go away every week and think about it. I might actually do something with that. But, you know, you know, it really wasn't relevant, actually. I mean, it's not relevant to your work. And I remember one of my colleagues had gone in beforehand, and his wife had been interviewed as well. And, um, and they said to him, could you name the books of the Bible for me? And he said, well, actually, if you own your Bible, in the front there's a list of contents, and you can do it. Well, I thought, well, that one's been played. I can't play that. Well, I got there, and I had my psychometric test, and I was sitting there with the, um, the general secretary, and he started asking me questions about turning the other cheek and that kind of stuff. And uh, I, was begin I was sitting there sweating, and I said, excuse me, sir, is this the 100 questions? And he laughed, and he said, that gets everyone sweating. He says, no, actually, we're not going to do the 100 questions to you, Bob. I said, oh, right. He said, oh, it's all right. No, we want you. He says, but... Um, you put so much effort into your paper, we realise that you do know what you're talking about. So, we'll come here. I think they still do the hundred questions. Now, we don't do that for deacons, okay? We'll just keep the 50 questions. Okay. See, in many ways, when we come to consider and pray about who we should vote for as a deacon, it actually should be obvious to us that this person is a candidate, whoever they might be. And whoever they might be, they exemplify the proof of what we've already mentioned. Now, we've already touched on the women thing, so I want to move on to verse 12. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife, and must manage his children and his household world. And someone might be thinking, ah, well, you see, you've said all that about women, but what about this one then? Well, the strength of this verse is actually seen in the emphasis that was in what is true of, of an elder. Sorry, I'll say that again. The strength of this verse is seen in the emphasis um, in that what is true of an elder is also true of a deacon 
if the deacon is male. Okay? <coughs> In context, historically, polygamy was commonplace. Okay, so actually, what Paul is encouraging is that a deacon be a one-woman man. Okay? Because if you're committed to several wives, you've got more responsibilities. So to take on the responsibilities office within the church, you'll be able to give less time to it. Also, there's another downside, isn't it, which he doesn't mention. If you've got six wives, that's six mother-in-laws, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the reason that women are not told to be the wife of but one husband is that culturally they didn't have a choice, and so it wouldn't have even figured in the equation. And the other part, which I always like to attach to deacons as well, is in regard to the family. The management of the family and the home, Paul uses a common sense approach, doesn't he? But this doesn't mean that we're to beat ourselves up if our Christians are not practicing Christians, because that's their own decision. What is important is how they regard you and your standards of your faith and your life. So with all that information, as we close this morning, we should, we, we should note real hope here, real vision here. The structure is given to us not as a real strict set of rules, but to help us to open our minds to engage with God, to participate in the divine nature, and actually give ourselves to the ministry of the church and consider who would be best to serve and represent us. Okay, it's engaging brain, isn't it? We might feel that on the face of it, we are very limited. And we look around and say, well, who could possibly be a deacon? How could I possibly be a deacon? And because we're not sure, we don't. We say, well, I won't nominate one, anyone, or I won't stand myself. But I want you to remember this. In God's economy, we can achieve greater things than we can ever think or imagine. What we've got to do is trust him. And maybe... Just maybe that is the real teaching here. Shall we pray? We do thank you, our Heavenly Father, for the Apostle Paul and his wisdom. We thank you for the way that he saw humanity and the way that you saw it, with all the potential that was wrapped up in it, but with all the difficulties too. And Lord, as we once again face this time of election and thinking about who we would have represent us as deacons, Help us not to get caught up in constitutions and rules, although they're very important, but help us to remember your word, to apply those truths and that teaching to the, of the scriptures to our fellowship, and help us to be, really be honest about who we would consider nominating, but in doing that, to be prepared to be 100% behind those elected people. So that it's not seen as them doing all the work, but us actually engaging together and these folk helping to guide that ministry. We do ask that you'd help us to remember that this is about hope and vision and engaging with you. About being part of your economy and understanding that you can achieve far greater things than ever we can ever think or imagine. And we ask that you'd help us to rise to the challenge and to learn to trust you that bit more that we might see the glory, your glory in our church. In Jesus' name, amen.